gift is not important as his gift or her gift. My gift is ineffective. My gift is not needed in the body. And Paul is saying, you don't know what you're talking about. You are saying something far more serious than you can ever comprehend. You are saying, in a sense, you are shaking your fist at God. You are putting your finger in God's eye and saying, God, you don't know what you're doing. Listen to me. A Christian who does not have a ministry is a contradiction. A Christian who does not have a ministry is disobedient. A Christian who does not exercise his or her spiritual gift is basically saying, God, you don't have the right to use me the way you intended to use me. You know, I want to testify to you because, you know, some of you see me up here and say, what does he know? What does he understand? I got news for you. There was a period in my life when I refuse to submit to the will of God in my life. I'm not proud of it, but I'm sharing it with you in order to encourage you. I refuse to obey God's will in my life. I denied God's gift in my life, and I did not want to use God's gift in my life. And I was not only questioning God and God's authority over me, but I can tell you I became miserable among men. (laughs) Until I... I said, yes, Lord. Did I begin to experience fulfillment and joy in ministry? And Paul is saying, as members of the one body, and Christ being the mind who's orchestrating all the members, He is the one, and He alone is the one to decide who is a hand, and who is a toe, and who's a mouth, and who's an ear, and who's a nose, and who's a whatever. Each one is controlled by the mind and by the will of God. He gives it to you. He uses it. And to say anything less, you're insulting the heavenly God. Now, let me plead with you. Do not despise your gift. Do not ignore your gift. Do not deny your gift. Do not sit back and wish that you had somebody else's gift. No, God has given you a gift, and that is specifically for you. Only you can do it. Only you can perform it. Nobody else can do it but you. And therefore, for you to say, my gift is not important, my gift is not needed, my gift doesn't matter, you are insulting the sovereign God who has given you that gift. And if somebody says, well, because I don't have a visible gift, therefore my gift is not important, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever seen your liver? (laughs) You better hope to God that you don't see your liver. (laughs) Have you ever seen your heart? Have you ever seen your lungs? And I want to submit to you today that without these, you can't live. A few questions. One, who taught Martin Luther his theology and encouraged him to translate the Bible? Number two, who visited D.L. Moody in the shoe store where he worked and led him to the Lord? And D.L. Moody rocked two continents for Christ. Three, what's the name of Charles Spurgeon's wife who stood by him And in the incredible suffering of depression that that great man of God had through the years and the many physical illnesses that he faced, without her strength, Spurgeon would not have been in the history books today. What's her name? Who financed William Carey's first missionary journey to India, which ignited the whole modern missionary movement today, 200 years ago? Who helped Charles Wesley to be the composer of hymns that he was? Who refreshed the Apostle Paul in the dungeon when he was writing his last epistle? Who discipled George Mueller and snatched him as a young man out of 
dreadful, sinful lifestyle. I'm going to stop. That's enough. Now, if you got 50% of those questions, please raise your hand. <laughs> okay, 25%. 25%. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Before you say, my gift of encouragement is not important. Before you say, my gift of prayer is not important. Before you say, my gift of giving is not important. Before you say, my gift of service is not important. Think of these people whom God used to change the church history and the lives they've touched and the lives they've changed would have been written differently without these people of whom you know maybe one or two. I want you to look again. Chapter 12, 1 Corinthians. Verse 18 and 19. Verse 18 says, But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body. Who did? Every one of them, just as He wanted them to be. Not what you want. Not what I want. As He wanted. Verse 19. And if there were all parts, or that is, Suppose all arms or all legs or all ears. <laughs> Where would the body be? Listen, we can have the best organized church. We can have the best administered church. We can have the best old machine of a church. But if the Spirit of God is not guiding each member to use his or her gift in the church and outside of the church, we are nothing but mechanical robots. Listen, my friend, you can sit back and sulk and sour and say, well, I don't have this gift or I don't have a big gift, I don't have a special gift. Or you can be obedient and say, I want to exercise my gift, whatever it may be. Now, back in 1985, I read that the U.S. has 768 ships, what comprise what they call the Mothball Navy. The Mothball Navy. Now, these vessels are anchored in harbors all around the country. They receive regular maintenance. Uh, the externals of these ships are uh, constantly repainted. Uh, periodically, and, and, and the hulls are continuously bombarded by electric impulses in order to retard the process of rust and corrosion, and, 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 and the great humidifiers are, are going all the time, constantly running in order to keep the moisture content at a very acceptable level. Of course, at the present time, they just sit. They can be ready at a short notice. Meanwhile, they just sit in the harbor. And I remember saying to myself, even back then, I thought, how many of God's people can truly be described as mothball Christians? Hello. <laughs> They're held together by the ministry and the support of others. Uh, when they don't attend church, somebody will call on them, and then they start going to church again. If they're discouraged and want to give up a Christian friend who encourages them and lifts them up, and, and, but they themselves do very little. They are snugly harbored in the church. They receive spiritual help from others, but they use very little of what God has given them. I'm going to ask you to stand right now. And I want you to come up front and say, this is my commitment to God and to the body that I am going to serve and I'm not just going to be receiving all the time. Will you do that? If you'd like to learn how to know God in a personal way, ask for the booklet, Finding the Joy You've Always Wanted. It will tell you of God's love for you and explain how to experience His forgiveness.
If you have a personal relationship with God and you're interested in walking closer with Him, the booklet Seven Steps in Your Faith Adventure will help guide you into a deeper fellowship with your Heavenly Father. Ask for your free booklet. عزيزي المشاهد اهلا ومرحبا بك مجددا في حلقه جديده من برنامجنا رساله في آية من زمان الانسان عايز يقرب من الله لكن ما الذي فعله البشر بهذا الشخص الكريم؟ اروع واعظم شعور داخلي بيتغنوا بحب الحياه وعشق الحياه ان الخطيه لا تترك صغيرا او كبيرا بتعدي بتفضح بتكسف هل تاتي اليه لتخلص من نار ابديه؟ يكفيك ما نزفته نتيجة الخطية الله عايزك تتمتع ولكن هذه هي الطريقة الصحيحة فتجد شعورا بالامتلاك والقناعة الداخلية يزيح خطاياك يستر اثامك ويكشف لك عن عظمة المسيح Hello, my precious friends. You don't need me to tell you that we live globally in a very troubling time. There is no peace anywhere. And you are not experiencing peace. And often we think as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ that we need government help, we need uh, foreign help, we need somebody's help. But today I want to challenge you to think about the greatest help and the greatest resource that you can ever have to have victory in the midst of trouble. The Bible from cover to cover teaches us that when we come to our ends, that's the beginning of God working in us. And so this is going to be a challenge to every one of you believers in the Lord Jesus to unite together in prayer. You know, let the denominational lines just melt away. Walk across your denomination or your church to somebody, other believer in another church and say, join with me. And then we add more people and more people. And when God's people begin to unite,